more successful ones have been obviously the strip press, which has just come to brute strength. We're back again with another one of my interview series, but this time, for the very first time, we're doing a part two series. So we got Josh back on here. How are you doing, buddy? Doing great, man. Happy to be back. Yes, sir. We uh we talked after we did that last episode, and we just were like, man, there was so much stuff we didn't get into. He has such a uh, a long career with it and success in the sport that we didn't get to talk about training and just some other stuff. So we figured we'd go ahead and make a part two of that. So I guess that's what we'll roll with. Yeah. Good deal. Well, I was just talking to Josh before uh, we started this. I said uh, I have a little bit of a, a knee injury that I just gave to myself, but we were talking about kind of injuries. Um, and this this injury for me specifically, it didn't actually come from a, a knee problem. It came from being tight with my ankles. So when I was doing a press, I ended up jamming my knee. So it's a funny thing when you get into it. We can talk about this, Josh. When you go – to the extremes in a sport or anything you do in whatever sports you do, there's little um, there's little outliers that can happen and things that can cause a problem, a host of problems for other movements. Like, you know, you would think, oh, I got a knee problem. You were squatting heavy. Well, no, it, it wasn't from that. Oh, you were in bad position when you did that. Well, no, it wasn't that. You know, same thing. Uh, I ended up getting a back injury years ago. Oh, well, that's because you were rounded over in a deadlift. No, my hip was tight, and it made me shift just a little bit, enough that you probably wouldn't be able to see it Um even on camera, it's so small with that. And uh, Josh, you can weigh in here and your thoughts, but you were saying you were somebody who's who's been really fortunate and blessed to not even have very many injuries in your career. So talk about kind of your mindset and how, how that uh, – even how you've avoided so much for such a long career. Yeah, man, it, it, I, I've – just never just again never had crazy injuries or anything serious but the, my biggest thing was my my back that i talked about you know in part one here but that that injury alone you know i i think taking the step back after you get injured addressing the whole chain instead of you know my my shoulder hurts i need to stretch my shoulder out a little bit more it's like you no know, why is your shoulder hurt is it your bicep pulling down on your shoulder because you've just neglected tightness other places the whole body is just i not saying anything groundbreaking but the whole body is just a chain and you need to start looking up and you know above and below where that issue is and starting start in just ways to address uh you know the root cause of the problem and heal that injury itself you know like for you with your knee you have qu tight quads bad ankle mobility like there's it, it's the the last thing you do is look at oh yeah i was specifically using my knee and i i squatted too deep or i my hit like you said i shifted over on a on a stone load or something like that and my knee went out that's never the way it goes it's always yeah. doing something completely unrelated and the number of times i've even heard of big guys just you know yeah i stepped off the curb wrong and and now my ankle hurts just for three years straight because it's mm -hmm. just like it's just the weirdest little things can set us off. But um, I mean, yeah, like, like you mentioned, I've been blessed enough to be mostly injury free, you know, having that sporting background, I think really helps. And you kind of see that for all the way up to the top guys and guys like Mitchell Hooper and um, some of these former, you know, some, some of these former athletes that uh, we're, we're doing some of these more grueling agility workouts. They've got bigger tendons. They've got, they've got just large ropey muscles out there that are just, tight they know what they they know what they're doing with them they're strong um and and i think that there's a lot to be said about kind of having that athletic background before you get into a strength sport like this absolutely um you know we talked about it and what you just said right there you know it's it's when something goes wrong or or even addressing the root of the problem instead of taking, you know, where you can't almost go to where the pain's at. You have to go back, take a step back farther with that. But, but with that being said, I kind of wanted to get into, um, 
when it comes to your training, that's we're talking about when you're on the other side of it after you've had, you know, an injury or a small little niggle, you know, where you, you mess something up or whatever. Um, but specifically, you can train in a way and pick the supplemental exercises or the ex- accessory exercises, rather, uh, which will benefit you for your main lift. So, like, if you're going to do something for um, – let's say, you know, before I do any shoulder press or anything like that, to keep my shoulders healthy and all my rotators and everything, I'll do a host of rear delts and back lats, and I'll get all those stuff primed because, you know, if you press all the time, you'll just get big front delts and you'll round over, and then you'll get lose mobility and have all kinds of problems there. A lot of guys, a perfect example, the bench press, you know, they bench, 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 and they come forward, and then they start getting pec tears. To offset that, you have to train hard the back, you know, kind of similar if you're doing any kind of yoke where you have to run fast or farmers or any kind of squat and deadlift, everybody wants to attack the quads. But if you start having knee problems and things like this, you really probably need to back up and hit the hamstrings because that's what's going to save those things. Do you uh, do you p- specifically pick exercises like that, like very detailed through what you're going to do? You, you know, I, I do. We – especially when just like you mentioned with things like farmers and and just working both sides of the muscle the contralateral muscles and everything like that that's what we just need to do mm-hmm. um it's always just been the way that we i've kind of ended up training that way you know it, it's I, there's there really is just a, i think a lot of people that overlook that specific aspect of it where you're just not training the whole uh you know, if you're talking about an event, training the whole muscle group that you're working and the whole every single part of you that's uh, that's going to be used in that event, getting those to work together, um, especially if you're doing things like, you know, working a little bit of hamstrings and quads on the same day. I've always found a lot of success with that, too, uh, mm-hmm. because that's creating that connection between those muscle yeah. groups to work, work together. Yeah. Um, and that way they know when you when you when it's time to pull, pull a giant sled or pull a heavy deadlift or something like that, they they're ready to work together. Yeah, exactly. Um, if you, you know, you separate them to break them down when you uh, are trying to isolate them, but that doesn't mean you just do this. Like you're not just going to warm up your hamstrings and then go do a big squat or big deadlift because, you know, then your hamstrings are going to be the only thing ready to go and your quads, you know, it's, it's got to still be balanced with that, you know? So, I mean, you warm them up, you might warm them up separately to go do something that requires both of them, you know, same way when you train for afterwards. Um, with that being said, Ed, let's jump into a little bit. How do you uh, structure your training? I know you work with uh, Flash from yeah. MSD Systems. How do you um, how do you go about that? You don't have to reveal anything that's specific or your secrets. You don't have to give away, but just kind of the structure and what you do and how you lay it out. Yeah, no secrets given out because I don't want anybody stealing any of this shit. Um, <laughs> no, but, yeah. but but for real, the 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 biggest thing that I've noticed with Flash is just the emphasis on warm up. Um, it's it's ridiculous my my wife i i my training partner is my wife i've got a home gym so we train together <laughs> out there and cool. she gives me so much shit um because my my warm-ups are almost as long as her entire workout so i'm yeah. i'm starting my working sets when she's wrapping up her workout and she's been working out for an hour at this point you know like <laughs> so the the priming for my training is <clears throat> there's a massive emphasis on it. I think that that was one of the biggest things that has tra- that has changed with me um, since I started, I joined flash and MST. They, that, that heavy emphasis on that, it's keeping me healthy. Um, my numbers are, are much, much larger. So you get this, you know, again, it's that muscle priming, priming your body, um, getting a little bit of cardio in, in the beginning to get the heart rate up a tiny bit and, and just get your butt, your body ready because of the training that, that we're doing is not a fucking joke at all. Sure. <laughs> well, also by doing that too, uh, you've got to be getting your uh, GPP up a little bit, your heart rate up, you're breathing heavy. You're, I mean, I'm, I got to be getting tons of volume before you do what you're really going to do. For, for real. It, it's a, it's a ton. Um, yeah. and, and I think that this, that, that specifically what you're saying, that GPP is one of the things that just allows me to be ready for, you know, I'm basically ready for any event. We're not losing yep. any strength or anything like that. This is the, I'm actively right now in a, in a restorative phase um, okay. of our training. So what that, the, what that really means is there's, it's not necessarily that we're going lighter or anything like that, but there's less emphasis on events. Um, it's kind of giving the body a chance to recover a little bit mm-hmm. from all the strain that we've been putting on it. It's, it's less of an off season, um, even though, <laughs> 
it's funny because I talk about longevity in this, uh, in the sport and everything like that. But I, you know, sat down with my coach and we kind of just talked about things and realized that I haven't had a an off season in damn near four years. Uh, I've never, I've never gone more than a couple months without competing or doing something. I've always been in the middle. So even during COVID, I, I set my American vlog record during a, an, an outdoor event at COVID, <laughs> you know, like in the park, in the car lot, like in a car park like that. Um, and, and then two or three months later, I was down in Kentucky doing uh, beast of the bluegrass to qualify for the Arnold. So it, it's even though when all these other people were taking time off to get stronger and everything like that, I've gotten stronger. Um, but through training and, and training for comps specifically, it, you don't really have a chance to necessarily get stronger. You become more proficient. And, yeah. and that's one of the things that I think that, uh, as soon as I realized that and, and, you know, speaking with coach, my coach and everything, it's, it's wild to think that I'm at the level that I'm at right now without having a legitimate strength block, um, you know, a long extended strength block in my, in my programming for over four years. So wow. we're excited to see where we get with this one. Yeah. What, what you just said there was sounds like to me, it sounds like your body was only, you know, like you said, when you go compete, that's where it's literally that's just that's just the max. You're not growing when you compete. I mean, that's you know, so if all you're doing is constantly competing, you're just trying to hang on to what you're doing. Yeah, you might be getting better because you're getting more efficient or you're getting better under pressure and competing. But like if you did that for four years, your body was only able to get a little bit stronger during the comp. And that's really not where you get stronger because you're tearing it down so far. Yep. So yeah, you've yeah. basically been hanging on for four years. <laughs> that's that's what it sounds like. <laughs> that's impressive. That's very impressive. It also shows how durable you are. Yeah, yeah. And, and again, I, I mean, I'm just I, I've been lucky with it with my the way my life structured, the way you know my job, um, the ability to work from home. Having yeah. right now, I'm less than thirty feet away from a fully equipped gym, and I can go in there any point that I want. Um, and and that convenience, I, I think that all of these things culminating together are what allowed me to get to the point that I am right now, but it's great to find out that I have these little things like nutrition and an yeah. actual strength block that I can still, I still have those in my arsenal where sure. a lot of people haven't gone through those yet. And, and it's, I'm, I'm not exactly proud to say that I haven't done it. Um, I, I wish I would have earlier, but it, it's, it's good to know that we get to this, we've gotten to this level and we're still, we still have room to grow. hundred um, percent. Yeah. I had, a uh, I had, where I was going to go with your training, you know, you're talking about uh, your warm ups and stuff like that, but we'll get back to that. You just said something, you know, you're 30 feet away from your own home gym. Um, you know, a lot of people need a team around them or they need to go to a gym and they need to have, uh, they get their, they talk about motivation. Yeah. It's going to be dedication, even if you have people around you, but a lot of people have to have training partners and things like that. They say uh, iron sharpens iron and, you know, you have to, you know, they'll be able to see things that maybe you didn't see, but um, I've always trained alone, and and you train alone, and you're a top, you're like a top, top, top level guy, and you train alone. Um, what are what are some of the reasons that you do that? And uh, as far as motivation and things like that, how do you feel about going to work out day in and day out by yourself? How does that work for you? Yeah, so it's I I will admit it's a you know there are big differences. There's huge benefits to both being in gym or having your home gym um, because that, that community around you, that that's why I think that's why all of us love strongman at the end of the day. It's like, it's, there's, there's a small conglomerate of people that are just enjoy lifting rocks up and they're just going to do that in their gym. They don't want to do anything else. You know, that that's, that's cool. But this whole strongman community, what you and I are doing, um, there's a lot to be said about that and being able to surround yourself with that, from the beginning of your strongman career, I think is really, really important and beneficial for people. That was where I started. I started out working out in a, in a good strongman gym with a lot of people around me. Um, I think I mentioned last time, Nick Ganya was one of the people that I got to train with a little bit. And, uh, and so there are definitely people around me to push me, um, especially high level athletes and everything like that. But ever since COVID I've been, I've been securely in a, you know, in a home gym and, and that's really when my career has gotten, uh, has taken off. And I think for me, there's a there is a huge part of it is just being motivated yourself to go out there and get the work done because it's nobody's there to push you. If if you don't go, 
nobody's going to notice. Whereas if you had, you know, you had, you're going into a gym, your buddy's going to give you shit for not showing up on lunchtime sure. for a strongman Saturday or something like that. Right. So the accountability part falls solely on you. Um, yeah. and, and you can put, you can post all your good lifts on, on social media and everything like that. And nobody's going to be any the wiser that you just are only in there once a week. If that's, yeah. that's what's going on. Right. Yeah. Um, so I think that community is really huge. The, the part for me that I think makes it more beneficial to be in my own home gym and my own closed environment is I, uh, th- there's, there's different type, types, types of distraction for you in a home gym, right? I think, you know, having your family there, having your dogs running in and out in my scenario and things like that. Like my neighbors out there trying to give me, you know, trying to get me to talk to them about some shit that I just don't really <laughs> care about. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of different things that just can oh into that distraction but i think that it um you still get that stimulus it's just a little bit different so i think a lot of people say that that you know having that distraction there on game day it's it helps you to, to drown it out when it when it really matters um i i don't know i i think that just having a competitive mindset kind of pushes that away a lot more um yeah and it, unfortunately it's not something that you can just teach it's something that you just need to adapt. It's going to be way different for you than it is for me. The things that calm me down, the way that I drown out distractions and things like that, like it, it's it's way different. Um, sure. But I'm not a dude that needs, and I don't know if you're like this or you know people that are like this, where they got to put a hype up song or something like that, like yeah, to to, to get themselves going. I I still remember one of the the biggest overhead lifts I ever did, the 320 log with, that was down in the basement of that old gym that I was at. Um, I, I put, I don't know if anybody's familiar with the gap band, but there's just a old band from the seventies and eighties, like, like funk disco type stuff. People were pissed that that song was on. And that's the song that I'm setting a record to. Like it, it's, it doesn't matter. Yeah. You know, I don't need to put on some death metal, even though I love death metal. I don't need yeah. to put on death metal just to, just to hit a PR or anything like that. And I think that yeah. that's a, another kind of cool thing about, um, <clears throat> you know, just getting that competitive mindset. Yeah. Two things I'll go with. First thing I'll say is um, you talk about, you know, people saying distractions when you train with a group of people or like in a gym, you can have distractions. That's going to be more like your competition, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, uh, for me, when I compete too, you know, every year that I've gotten better, it's when I can get my mindset and that feels like there's nobody there. It's just yeah. me. When you zone into that place, uh, last year at Worlds was probably the best I've ever been to where I, n- I never saw any people like the crowd or this or that. I never I never even I never heard or saw anything when I fought when I got right there before this moments. It was like they were gone. It was almost like euphoria, like you were outside, outside your body experience. Like and that's that's how I know. OK, that's right. So many people get up there and they try to have this hype and they'll actually distract themselves from the mission by trying to hype themselves up, they'll get over. And that is a real thing. I did that for years. You think, Oh, I have to get fired up. Well, no, there's moments that I might have to get fired up. There are moments that I might have to scream right before lift, but that's not every time. And that's not most of the time. Most of the time I just have to get in that place where it's just me and, you know, training a home gym. I was finally able to make that connection. Uh, another big thing with that, you know, without having training partners, you know, um, People say, oh, they'll call out, they'll call out your lifts and they'll help you. What looks better, what will you know help you critique things and things wrong. I video every single one of my sets. That's the main thing. And I and and I'm not trying to sound arrogant, but I know more than what probably almost everybody that I'm gonna go to a gym knows how it's supposed to look. And if I don't, I'm going to be comparing it constantly to the best and what they do. Not just one guy who, who I like the way he looks. I'm going to be comparing it to a host. Oh, this guy's got this. That's a little different. This guy's got that. That's a little different. But with his body structure, blah, blah, blah. And I can piece together what mine's supposed to look like. And sometimes people have given me bad advice before. I mean, and they'll say, oh, well, you need to try this. You try that. And it's just like, I mean, it sets you back a while. Also with that, you get into that mindset, hey, man, you had an extra rep there. You should hit that. You had an extra three reps there. And it's like, okay, sure, I did. But am I trying to hit my extra three reps and be trashed? Or am I trying to recover as quickly as I can so I can go do this again when I need to? You know, there's the yeah. whole slew of those things that 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 I, um, I found critical to have a home gym. Dude, there, that is one of the things I think people don't – we need to emphasize this. <laughs> Com- the community you have around you 
is going to have a bu- if you're in a and you're in, in a public gym and you've got a bunch of strongman athletes there. There's going to be a bunch of fucking idiots, yeah. a lot of them, and they're going to yeah. give you bad advice, and they're just yeah. going to be you're going to be in an echo chamber about people hyping you up about how good you are and how great your your lifts look, or they're going to be you know just like that telling you that you should have done more reps when you're like no my programming says this. There's yep. a time to there's a time to put out the effort to get those extra reps, and it sure as hell isn't on a Thursday, eight weeks out from a competition. Like right. there's no reason to do, or even if you're in the offseason, like why are you going to do that? Get you you're you're not there to have a dick measuring contest. And I think <laughs> that's one of the things that keeps happening in in public yeah. gyms. Um, is that you're you're surrounded by a bunch of people with just jacked up on testosterone, and they're just looking to compete and with competitive people like that. Yeah. Um, that can, that can be a, a blessing and a curse at the same time and, yep. and just be very critical about the community that you surround yourself with um, and who you choose to take advice with, because there's some really good people that give really bad advice. Yep. <laughs> you know what I mean, it's like, yep. it, it might not be personal or anything like that, but um, yeah, just always, uh, always being critical and aware of that, I think is another sure. very overlooked uh, aspect of training. Yeah. I'd have to be, I'd have to be um, very careful if I ever did get a training partner, because, you know, there is that saying, I, you know, I said again, iron sharpens iron, you know, and, and I believe that, but um, it would have to be in a way that where you might be competitive and that's good, healthy competition. But when you're trying to train and really get better, it's not, it's just like you said, it's not on Thursday in the middle of an eight week or off season, whatever. It's not there. That right there is all about how can I just keep my body getting better progressively? You know, if my buddy, if, 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 if I'm realistically a 315 for eight reps for, 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 t- for three sets, whatever, say, or how don't care, whatever it is, that's my weight that I can do comfortably for this. And this guy, he's up to really doing 365. Well, could I push it and try to hit 365? Maybe, but is my body going to recover like his 365 is? Well, if it can't, then I can't have that. I have to be honest with yourself. You know, a lot of people, that's another thing. They came up with percentages. Then they came up with RPE. Um, Those only work if you're honest with what you're true, with what those numbers are, you know? Yeah, just just when you're talking about RPE or percentages and everything like that, there's if you're if you're not honest with yourself about what those actually are, and this is something that comes with you know the longer you train, the better you're going to get at this. The the more you know your body, you'll know that an RP seven on Wednesday isn't the same as an RP seven the next Thursday. You know what I sure. mean? Like they can, that can change week to week. Yeah. Um, so I, I hate people like when it, you cannot live and die by your, by your RPE, you know, it, it's, it, it's a lot more about using that as a, as a solid measuring stick and, and knowing yourself and being able to know that you're not trying to just push it just yeah. because you want to do something today uh, or just yeah. because you're a little extra pissed off today and you want to just burn <laughs> off a little extra, like it, it, that, and that's the self-control that I think a lot of people lack. Um, yeah. And it's yeah. so easy just to write that off. It's so easy just to write it off. You know, like th- how many times have you heard that that statement? Like, oh no, I don't need a therapist because I got the gym. You know, stuff like that. <laughs> like, it's like, dude, you're you're hurting yourself more in, in more ways than one. You're not you're not healing anything right now, and you're just you're you're gonna end up fucking yourself up in, yeah. in the long run. It's not gonna help you. No, RPE is just simply another tool to try to help yourself. That's all it is. It's just another gauge, another tool. It's almost setting the governor on what you need to do sometimes. That's that's all it is. Yeah, um, I like that. Um, okay, so you were talking about your warm-ups, really long warm-ups. It's hilarious. It's something I've had to do. That's been the biggest game changer for me, too, is a really long warm-up. Okay, so you get through your warm-ups. Um <clears throat> I've got two questions with that. Uh, number one, when you get through your warmups, depending on what you're going to, do you take a long time to get, like, say you're, you're uh, let's say it's deadlift, okay? And you know that you have to do some working sets, which you can explain what your working sets look like. But if you have to get there and you've done a really long warm up, do you take small, gradual jumps or are you pretty much ready to go to where your kind of working set is at? What's your approach on that? Yeah. So for, if, if we use deadlift for an example, I am definitely just a start throwing plates on type of guy. Um, yeah. Yeah. I another funny part about having a home gym is I've, I've got uh, a couple pairs of hundred pound plates that I'm using. 
So I, I've graduated up from, you know, going 135, 225, 315. So now I'm just I'm just starting at 245 and yeah. loading plates on after that. Um, but I usually do do just kind of the the plate jumps um, up until you get to about 70 percent of where your working set's going to be and then kind of, you know, tighten those down a little bit. Um, but I, I it's just like the RPE. I, I, I'm not married to any sort of specific warm up or anything like that. Um, well, I'm you don't have to, you don't have to be because if you've no. really done the correct loading and warm up before that, your body's loaded to go. Your body doesn't get warmed up by doing deadlifts. The only thing that's written warmed up for the deadlifts and what would make sense to me to do adding the plates it would be your CNS because that's getting you primed up. Okay, we're getting ready to pick up this heavy weight, but yeah. your hamstrings aren't going to get warmed up by doing a few reps here and there. The next because they're not all working yet, yeah, all works together, but they don't all have the same demand together if you warm everything up as you're going to do it like for example you know warm your hamstrings warm your 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 quads a little bit get your i like to get my traps ready to go in my uh lower back i like to get all those things ready because if one of those things is out well my arms are going to hang too far or my hamstring will pull a hamstring you know it's got to all but if it's all warmed up i'm pretty much ready to go ready yeah. 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 There's, there, there's, there's not, you, you nailed it. Just the getting your CNS ready, I think is the most helpful part of just the, that gradual increase and in everything. Um, but I always laugh at people that forego any sort of actual muscle priming or warm up, and they just start putting plates on. Uh, and, and even if they start from just the bar and move up, it's like that, that's not, that is not warming up for deadlift. That is deadlifting. When right. you came to OSG last year, or shoot, we'll go any contest, you know, yeah. what you just said is what everybody does. That's how they start warming up. Little guys will start warming up a long time before, and they'll start just, you know, real warm with plates and things like that. How do you warm up uh, at a contest like that? Because you are very limited on what we would do. You know, I'm extremely limited. So, I mean, I, I have my little setup that I like to do before, and I, and I kind of get to where I have to use the bar, you know, and plates to warm up some but I definitely have a protocol that I do. How do you do that? Um, so I'm, I'm kind of similar. Um, there's, there's a light protocol, but the, the, as comps near, I start warming up as if I would in competition. Um, so I'm planning on doing limited warm, more, more limited warmups or larger when I'm getting near to contest, what I really try to do is I warm up very similar to what that comp setting is going to look like. So more or, you know, limited warm ups, larger jumps, um, and, and just kind of get it, it helps you to get into that mindset. I, I am a big proponent of uh, train how you're going to compete, warm up how you're going to compete, you know, don't change things on comp day. There's something, you know, guys that we talked about before with adrenaline dumps, they suddenly start getting jacked right before they do a lift and they never do that before uh, mm -hmm. during the training. So um, if we're talking deadlifts, uh, again, I, I just set myself where I have, let, let's say we've got 20, full, 20 minutes to warm up for deadlift um, and you're only going to be able to take a jump maybe every five minutes because mm -hmm. of the number of people, number of people that are there and, and trying to warm up at the same time, right? Follow that with a lo a much longer period where you are not allowed to touch the barbell, you know, where you are only using bands or you're only using body weight. You're just doing a little bit of movement around to stay loose and then going straight into your working sets. Um, no, no major warmups or anything like that. That's usually the way that I work when I get closer to uh, closer competition. But I do agree that earlier, uh, you know, when you're in off season, when you're earlier on in preps, having those warmups where, like I said before, taking the, the specific jumps, moving up slowly, uh, kind of priming the CNS, um, getting that done during those periods is a lot. It's what I would prefer, but it's not sure. realistic for competition. And that's my end goal is being able to compete um, and remove any of those outside factors as much as possible. Sure. I, it's it's amazing what, what bands can really do, isn't it? Just, Crazy. just a just a light band being able to. I mean, that's all I do too. I bring a, a I bring a. It's not even that heavy of a band because I use the same band that I would use to warm up my triceps and shoulders, yep. you know. But I mean, I do my back extensions, try to do some leg curls with it, try to do a little bit around the neck squats with it. Just get that blood moving, get your body. At that point, you have to be an athlete. Your body has to remember what to do anyway. I mean, it's just got to yep. it's just got to be loose. 
and as ready as it can be to go. Exactly. And, and man, one of my one of my favorite things about bands is they pack so easily. You can yep. get them anywhere. They can fit in the yep. carry on. You can bring them to competitions with you. I, <laughs> I pack up bands. I love that they're just so packable. That's the best part about bands. Um, and I've even started bringing like a booty band with me, so you can warm yep. up your uh, your shoulders a little bit and just do some overhead extension, get a little bit of mobility work in. Um, there's just no reason to not bring those with you to a comp. Just bring two, one light one, one heavy one. Um, yep. They're just so versatile. And when you're talking about competitions, like there's only so much that you're going to have to be uh, warming up with. If you're at a, at a very high level competition, you can expect to have, you know, more warm up equipment. That doesn't mean that you're going to be able to have, um, you know, solid actual quality warm ups or anything like that. You never really know what's going to be there. So just control what you can control and bring your own bands. That's it. Yeah, that's all you can do. Um Backing up now to what we were talking about before, you know, <laughs> here we are for the third time about your warm up. But you finish your warm up. Uh, most training, I mean, it, there, there's so many different ideologies and uh, training methods that you can use. But you know, you've got you've got two real extremes. You've got conjugate style in linear periodization style. Uh, a lot of your strongman athletes will dabble in between both. That's what a lot of your top level guys for you. Uh, how does that look for you? You know, you get through your warm ups and your structure, your training, where does it go from there? How is it, how is it uh, set up? There, there's, there's some conjugate aspects, I think in my training. Um, but we, we really do focus on linear progression. Uh, I think that there's, there's benefits to conjugate, but I'm never, you know, what I joked about this last time that I'm not, I don't know a whole bunch about training, you know, training ideologies and everything like that. But I know, I know about conjugate. Um, I, I think that it's, it's a good, good, well, like it's a well-structured program for somebody that's just looking to stay in the gym. Um, it'll get you stronger. That's for sure. But doing 20 different types of deficit deadlifts with chains and bands, I, I think it gets it just a little bit excessive. And and when we're sure. talking about a specific carryover to the sport of strongman, um, I'm a big proponent of linear progression and just yeah. getting stronger, getting good at things that you need to be good at. Um, and that's how you start that, you know, nailing out and eliminating your weaknesses. Uh, sure. You know, whether well, it, it, you know, it gets, it gets too far from what is the thing, what is the thing that you have to do? I understand, you know, you want to be an athlete and be able to do multiple things. I understand that. But in the end, there's one thing that you have to be able to do. And what what is that thing and how are you trying to get to, you know, a deadlift is a deadlift. I mean, trying to change up a million different things. It's different if you're attacking it from your weakness. Um, a lot of conjugate that you probably use, like I use, is, you know, we do all kinds of different warm-up stuff. We do different variations of things like that. But when it comes down to trying to get better and stronger, what you're doing, linear progression is is going to be – you have to be able to slowly get better. It's hard to be at a constant state of max all the time. Um, also, you know, speed, you have to be fast, which I'm not going to get major into all that. Well, we can, but um, yeah. you kind of can get lost in the sauce with some of that stuff. But um, even you know, talking about your um, your your warm ups, you're getting. I mean, how much tonnage would you say your volume you're getting from just your warm ups? You know, I mean, a lot, a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. Yeah, um, and and that's really that's kind of where that's where people get lost with the linear progression because they say as the weights get heavier, the reps come down, your volume comes down, you're becoming less and less of an athlete. Well, of course, that's bad. That's hit me before when you just do solely. But if you're smart with your training, that's just for one tool. That's for one specific thing. The athletic side has to be done before and after and all your volume because that's what it really comes down to for training, isn't it? It's how much volume can you uh, do. That, that's, that is exactly it. Just what's, what's your aerobic capacity? What, what's, the, yeah. what's the capacity that you have on your body and how much can you put it through before, before it starts to break or before you need to, to take a break? Um, sure. And yeah, so and, and I think a linear progression gets you to that point um, in in a much healthier way than conjugate does. And, and it's the I I view I view having that that shotgun approach of traditional conjugate for me is just a a lot more injury prone and just the the risk reward just isn't there for me. 
Um, yeah, it's not it can't work for somebody, but just just for me and for strongman, it's not what I would uh, I would prefer. Yeah, running running it, I ran it uh, really really to the script um, for last year at Worlds, um, and it did jump me up. I mean, I'll say my training was a lot better because I went from you know it wasn't true thirty first. I was just a terrible, but I went from thirty first to twelfth, um, and all I ran was conjugate mainly last year. But what I took away from that was the athletic side, uh, the, the volume that we're talking about here, the, the other way I ran it, um, injuries, it was probably less chance for me personally of an injury only because, uh, I was controlling it back so far because see, I, we talked about earlier, understanding your RPE. So if I'm going for max, it's not, I wasn't going for all out max where it was going to break and wreck my hips or do that. You know, it was, it was kind of a backed off RPE. So it did work well for that and durability, but it didn't help for the specific, the specificity when it came to being specific, it wasn't there for that. That, that messed me up a little bit. So I'm not going to run it down, but I'm not going to say that that's all I do. Anybody who would just stick to one exact thing. I think that you can miss out on a lot of other stuff because there's benefits to, I mean, a lot of it. I mean, you may have world champions all did different things, you know? Yeah. That's the reason why I just anybody that says any coach that says that they are you know that they're a conjugate coach, yeah. or and I'm and not even just says shit on conjugate, just any if they are specifically saying they are only do this type of coaching or yeah. this type of programming, they're not using other aspects or training methodologies. That you got to run away from people like that because they are yeah. they are never going to be outside of their bubble. They're not going to have yeah. as good of athletes. Um, it's it's crazy to to think that somebody is able to do that or they you know they think that that's the only way to do it but it it will get you stronger any program and, and this is another thing i've just said i say to a lot of my athletes is and any program can get you stronger if you just stick to it and yeah. literally anything it doesn't I, yeah. I could be running you into the ground with just volume you're gonna get stronger um yeah. but it is what's the risk reward yeah are you For how long in, how long for how long how how much work are you going to put in to get this much out of it you know sure. is, is is it the efficient way to do it probably not sure. um, exactly and, and that's me like i said i've said it before i'm pretty lazy when it comes to training i want it i want to hack this as much as possible work as little as i can to get as much strength as and strength and uh and pay out as i can from this um, but that's that's literally that's literally what training that's genius. I mean, yeah. really, that's what you're, that's what you, sh we love to, I, I love to train. So many of us love to train where you just want to be in there for forever, but that you've got to get in and get back out what you have to do and get better. That's what it's all about. So running that, do you do, do you stick to, um, I'm sure it changes. I understand, but does you do a lot of five by fives, five by, do you like triples? Do you like fives? What do you, what do you like? What do they run a lot of? Yeah, so I mean, we, we've we've got some fives. Um, like I'm I'm doing. Uh, we do different waves. Um, so we do you know start with a set of you know set at eight, go down to five, go down to three, but just drum the weights up the whole time, um, okay. and then come back for your second set and essentially do whatever your second weight was from your first set. Now you're doing that for eight, then you're going up for five. You're doing your third weight for five. And then going up and hitting an even heavier three. Uh, so, so is that out. based off of is that based off of waves? So you say you did no. you do that as amount of reps. Is that like for a wave? Is a wave four weeks for you? Is a wave? I mean, how long is a wave? Uh, it, again, it depends. But we we've did we've kept this that that in for. I mean, I think we're at six weeks now. Um, okay. On doing these different waves, on, on doing RDLs that way. Um, okay. And yeah, so like. That, that so I'm, I'm week, doing a lot of strength gains from that one. That's for sure. So week one, so week one, talk me through your, you're doing RDLs sure. week one, you go through, you do your reps. Uh, you hit those. It's what was it? You said, you said eight reps or whatever. Yeah. So I'll say and like then, eight reps, at, eight reps at three sixty five. Okay. So then, so then week two is week two heavier with five reps. Yeah. So yeah. So week, week two will be heavier with eight reps. The fifth, okay. the five reps would be more. So the weights progress progressing up every single time. So it's that's that linear progression, but it's okay. also the, the the style of the uh, of the reps are just you know going eight five three, take a break, go back and come and hit and then hit eight five three again at a heavier weight all in one day. 
Um, oh, that's an, okay. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So I misunderstood you. So if you start, so let's say you start at 365, you do eight, five, three. Those are your working sets. Eight yep. sets, eight reps the first time, five, and then three. Then yep. you take your time off. And but in the same work day, and, and the same working set. So you take like five minutes or so, okay. and, and and reload your weights. And then so I do. But if we're just using an example, so eight, I do eight reps for uh, three eighty five, and then okay. five reps for four fifteen, and then three reps for four seventy five, something like that. Um, wow. Yeah. And so and and just and just progressing those up as we uh, as we get a little bit stronger and deeper into this. It's okay, so that's really interesting because you're keeping <clears> – <throat> that's not a traditional uh, mm -hmm. linear approach in the fact that, you know, um, it's not like you say you did 365 for eight and then and then the next week you did 385. That's not – you're actually – you're doing it all kind of – you're working volume yep. and kind of that heavier-ish – train on your body so you're doing it all in one shot see i was interested how they were doing that without yeah. losing that volume and stuff so that's interesting so three 365 you would do for eight then say you'd go to five and you work up to 415 and then your triple you would do it like 475 in that range yeah yep. okay you run and that then you for come back again and and do and then your so your your set of eight would be at 385 and okay. then your second set would be at you know four 425 yeah. something like that or, yeah. even, or even as high as 475 and then your next one's up into the fives um and wow. like that's, that's the area where i'm getting right now is you know getting you know triples for i think i did i did 495 last week or, or this week um very good yeah <laughs> did um do you do that workout in that style is that a once a week kind of thing we're hammering my hamstrings right now because that's yeah. my I, I I feel that's my lacking point for deadlift. Um, yeah. So we've got we've got RDLs, we've got stiff leg deadlifts, uh, things like that, just to really hammer my um, my hamstrings. I'm I'm not allowed to do a deadlift from the floor until I can stiff leg 600. Uh, okay. So that that's our goal for this block. Um, Very good. So folks, focusing on the hamstrings, we're pressing twice a week right now, uh, and then squatting okay. once a week as well. Like yesterday, so I was doing zombie front squats <laughs> i saw that yeah dude that's a um that really crushes uh and makes your upper back work hard doesn't it bro the, my my trunk has never yeah. been stronger um wow. like just doing this random restoration phase this shit that i've got that they've got me doing um i'm feeling really good about the way my core is just the, the strength is going up so so much um and from things like front squats and then all of my accessories that i've never seen anybody do before that that flash and chain are just cranking out i'm just so fucking confused half the time and i gotta watch they, they send me I, I bug them to send me videos about how to do some of this shit and, and so i watch those 30 times to figure out how to do this stuff right um well but that's like because you don't even you don't even, you don't even know how to, you don't know how it's supposed to look let alone how it's supposed to feel once yeah, you do yeah, feel yeah. Like yeah yeah okay interesting well that was really okay i love what the approach and what you're doing there with deadlift now uh when you cut okay so just walk me through that's deadlift how do you approach uh your like upper body you're pressing you know and and you know we've got so many different implements you have to do for pressing yeah. dumbbells totally different than an axle you know deadlift whether it's on an axle deadlift bar it's different but it's still deadlift you know depressing exactly. can be a lot different how do you do your pressing Pressing, I, I can't even commit to one specific type of, uh, you know, one type of structure or anything like that. But what we do is we are rotating out, you know, if you, you, both my, you know, my most recent comps have been, have had ladders where you're doing multiple different uh, implements. So I think that this was a unique space that I've been in for the past eight months um, or more even than that, like having to do log and axle in the same day. So if you're doing log, if you're doing log from the floor, um, make sure that you do axle from the rack. Um, Good. So, and, and then we're, and working in, uh, at working in strict pressing has been a huge uh, strength gain for me as well. Um, through various rep ranges, strict presses from the rack, pin presses, um, and doing those with axle and log have been really, really helpful um, for just building with kind of that well-rounded strength. Uh, in the upper body there. I still say if you want to get a if the my the best strongman movement, the best builder for everything on your entire body, it's log. 
If you have weak hamstrings, do more log. If you've got a weak back, do more log. If your arms aren't strong enough, log. Like it, it is the best all over or all around um, exercise and strongman, in, in my opinion. Very interesting. I was going to, I was getting ready. It's funny that you said that. My question I was going to ask you was somebody who's good like yourself at log and axle uh, and somebody like me, I'm not very good at log. I'll just be honest. I'm a lot better at axle. I've never, I've never been able. My problem with log is <clears throat> my style. When I go to press the log to be good, I'm terrible at the push press on log. If I want to do log, I have to copy almost the uh, Shane German or German, sorry, however he yeah. says it but where I have to almost lock in my legs so tight and almost get that lean back and almost like, almost like a strict press, like, but the axle, you know, I can press that way and I can be strong that way, but with the axle, it's totally different. I get it upright. I get a nice dip and everything on the log. I've never got the dip comfortable. I know elbows high and I've even got to where I can dip and it doesn't dip on me quite front, but between, between the way it sits on my chest it's a little bit higher, so that throws me off in my position where I'm not as comfortable. The hands being in a neutral grip, between all that stuff, I've never got to where I felt really comfortable in the log. I've hit okay numbers, but hitting an okay number does not mean that you feel good or proficient in an area. No, no, not at all. And and that's one of those things like, you know, for you, I'd, I'd recommend uh, – Something that helped that that has helped a lot of people. It helped me as well. Is uh, really heavy cleans. Okay. So like cleaning more than you can press with sure. no intention of pressing it. Just clean it. Doing that um, and pause dips. Again, don't press it. Just yeah. get that get that leg drive down because it's like I said with with uh, with the Viking press. There there are like it it is a leg movement. It's not an upper body movement. You can make an upper body movement. I used to be like a really big into jerking and then I just lost the skill. I need to get that skill back. Um, but you see people nowadays where that all of the power is coming because they're putting up huge numbers because they can split jerk yeah. or that they can push jerk. Um, yeah. I, I've, I'm guilty. It's funny I'm saying this because I'm guilty of kind of reverting back to the, to the push jerk. But my legs have gotten so damn strong. My shoulders are so strong that I can, I can keep up with people that are jerking. Um, and one guys that are really proficient at jerking as well. So it's, it's, uh, don't, don't take a sound bite of that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh. <laughs> uh, I'm so tuned, zoned in to the training. <laughs> I just missed right over that, but yeah, that was pretty good. I like that. Um, oh, so for me then moving on, I just, I, I'm going to probably do that. Then I understand overloading your system. I mean, if you're not comfortable, if you're, if, if you feel strong on the press, you know, if I can press a 300 pound axle, no problem. But when I come to a log and it feels like, you know, death on my chest, a 300 pound log, well, that would go to show you something. I just never, that, that tightness that I got with an axle, even, yep. even when my, I've got the mobility now for it's on my front shoulders, it rests across my shelf. But before, when I didn't, I still could set it here and it was stable. Now that log, it that log always wants to teeter. I can never get the back tightness unless I just get pissed off and say I'm going to strict press the thing, you know? Dude, there's <laughs> – you, you've heard people say, you know, like it, I, I know it's a little bit cheesy, but just do one hard thing every day. Yeah. Like, that might just be log. Right? Yeah. That uh, it, It's – it is a proven way to get to break through plateaus. It's a proven way to get past, uh, you know, challenging things. Just doing that thing repeatedly once or twice a day, you will, you will be able to get past those things. Like my, like I, I was struggling with stone loads. I, I, after PSL last year, I, uh, I had like a tacky situation where I put my tacky on too soon. It was too hot. I had the wrong grade, whatever it was. And, and I couldn't load a, whatever it was a three twenty. 350 whatever that stone was um i only did it once because the thing it was just everything was slipping right that got in my head about just having issues with stone and like being able to load a stone properly right yeah and and our way of getting past it was you're just loading a stone where you're loading you're loading a stone or a bag every day for a long time <laughs> like just once or, or one, once every time you're in the gym you're loading that thing over a bar and you're in and out there's not a bunch of not no extra bullshit or anything like that. And 
it, it'll it'll get you past it. It's just that repetition and being able to do that one hard thing. I I really really like that. That's like uh, uh, Benny Magnuson said one time. He said if you're trying to keep getting better without doing the thing, he said you're just being a skate artist trying to yeah. figure out how to not do it. You know, do the thing, and you know. I, I, I could go around and try to attack all kinds of stuff for log with state examples what we're talking about, but my upper back's strong because what I'm doing in the gym with the other stuff, my triceps are strong. You know, my legs are good on the push or jerk on the, on the uh, axle. So what's the difference on the log? You're not comfortable on it. Have yep. I been training? Have I been training the log like I should? Well, well, no, I'm trying to get my, my axle continued. Well, well, maybe you should back up and hit the log a lot more. <laughs> well, that's part of the pride. Because it's yep. it sucks being in the gym, and even interesting thing, kind of go full circle here. Even when you're alone, it is so easy for you to just only do the things that you're good at. Yeah, you're not like you're not showing off for anybody. Yeah, you're you're not trying to show people that you that you're stronger than them on axle, and that's why you just keep hitting axle all the time. It's like you you do what's comfortable, and and a yep. huge part of the sport is just trying to get uncomfortable. Sure. Um, and and I and you you have to adapt. You've got to be ready for anything. And I, I think that that's like just tackling your weaknesses. Yeah, um, that's how you become a well-rounded strong man. You see some of the guys at the top, and and you they're just not bad at anything. Sure. And, and even like in my in my case, I consider myself a ba- a bad deadlifter. Mm-hmm. And I and I still have a six seventy five pull, like a six seventy five yeah. raw pull, no suit, and that 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 was my PR. Yeah. And, like I consider myself to be a bad deadlifter. I finished sure. 11, 12th. I finished 12th behind Chris Harper at OSG. And like that one event, if I, if I bring that up, then that's an entirely different story. Like sure. I'm, I'm finishing top five on everything else. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, what you just said there, you know, talking about your pride and, and, and you just have and the challenges and things and what you're talking about all full circle. Um, shoot, we can even back up and talk even about something. You know, you're somebody who has to – you have to find a way sometimes when there isn't a way, and there's challenges and things that you have to praise, and you have to get through them. They're really hard adversities. Uh, You told me something about you that I didn't even know at all, but it was before you started Strongman. Now, you can go into that if you want to now. Yeah, so, so, yeah, not a lot of people know this, but there – I. Actually, back in uh, college, I was diagnosed with uh, testicular cancer. So I, I went through a whole uh, whole scare with, you know, have, have in and out of the doctor for over a year, having to get surgery. Uh, I think I'm, I'm actually coming up on 10 years um, cancer free on this, but it's, you know, getting get having that finding finding that out as a young guy. So, again, dudes, <laughs> like check your nuts. Like, let's get, get the shit checked out because I was even in the case where I, I probably would have been an entirely different scenario had I not been dating uh, a girl who was a, a little bit more aggressive than most. Um, and, and that was how we found out that, that mm. I had tested your cancer. Um, so, like, get yourself checked. Um, but that that whole, you know, being in and out of the doctor all the time, um, having to go in for surgery at, you know, I'm 21 years old. and I am going in for major surgery. Like you got people don't expect that type of shit to happen to them. Um, yeah. I was a very healthy guy. I've always been a healthy guy. I don't get sick or anything like that. Um, I'm rarely at the doctor. And yeah. so for that to end up happening, um, it kind of shows that it can happen to anybody. And, and was, uh, I mean, my gosh, I can only imagine um, that feeling when, when you got diagnosed with that. Well, I mean, I, what was going through your head? I mean, I'm sure probably fear and just anxiety, yeah. not knowing, you know, kind of what the deal was. It just, yeah. I mean, not knowing what, what to expect, you know, never obviously being blindsided by it and everything like that. And then you've got, you know, just a bunch of doctors telling you that like, again, to the point where it's sim- similar to my cert- my story about my back, like they're talking about c- scheduling me for an oreectomy, like the next day, like we need to take it off now. Like it's that big of a deal. Um, and and so like it it hits you it doesn't come at you slow like it's not no. this slow burn or anything like that like you get it all dumped on you at once and you got to deal with these things all at once and it's and it's tough to be you know I, I mean immature I was still a kid when that happened you know yeah. um, and I think that that's there it's it nothing's ever going to prepare you for something like that and just how you uh, how you address those things and how you tackle that and move on from it is is 
a lot a, a lot more telling about your character than I think a lot of people realize. That's what I was gonna say. So how how did you go through that? What was I mean? What was the the thoughts process? Am I? I mean, yeah, how did you get through that? Because you said you're just a kid. I mean, shoot, I know where I was at when I was 21 years old, and yeah. it wouldn't have been a mental state to prepare me for that. No, it, and and that was, that was a tough part too. Being you know being away from family at the time, um, not having them very close to you, and and like you know you've got your friends. My friends were very supportive at the time and everything. My roommates especially, which was cool, um, but. I think ha having a support system around you is always is always helpful. But at the end of the day, it, it is kind of just you and you're the yeah. only one that's really impacted by it. You're the only one that can actually do something about it. And uh, that was that was the way that I approached it, it was I didn't want to run from this. Um, mm. I think there's it's a lot like training. You know, you you talk about your knee hurting or something like that. And you and instead of just tackling the problem and fixing it it's a lot easier to deny that there's actually a problem there. You just keep pushing through it. Just say, Hey, it'll get right. better by itself. And that type of thing doesn't happen with, you know, like a cancer diagnosis. And then mm -hmm. if you start, you know, in my, in my case, at least like kind of sliding into a depression and everything like that. Sure. Um, and just being able to like, you know, getting the help that you need and admitting that you don't need to do this by yourself. Um, that's your choice. If you want to do it by yourself, you can, you can do that. I chose to not be alone with it. Um, and, 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 you know, embrace people that are there to help you and, and just use everything at your disposal to, to come out on the other side. Yeah. Is that what you would say, you know, what pulled you through your depression when you started to get depressed with that? Was the people that you surround yeah. yourself or was it was it the light of kind of you just were going to you've got such a your mindset now. It's easy to see, especially with your competing. You're just you're going to make you're going to go through. You're going to make it happen. You know, when you compete, you talk about now the challenge. Sorry, you talk about then the challenges with that and you equate it to training. But, you know, you can see that when you compete, when you do stuff, you know, you're going to you're going to get through it. You know, you're going to find a way. So is that kind of I guess that's a two part question. Is that where you'd say some of that comes from now? And then number two, when you pulled yourself out of that depression, did you rely heavily on your people? Your, I mean, faith or what, what kind of pulled you yeah. through that? Yeah. You, you know, and it's like. I, I think that the the whole mental health thing is definitely an always an it's always an ongoing game. You never you yeah. never fully uh, fully back or anything like that. And and, and I'm still somebody that goes to a therapist. Fucking love it. Yeah. Um, and and it's so it's like again using everything at your disposal to get through these things. But you know, I, I think fr friends helped a lot. Um, but I'm in, in kind of it'll be bad advice. Um, but I'm very good at carp uh, compartmentalizing things. Mm. Um, in in a beneficial way like you know i i don't i don't just ignore like i don't know those people where if, if somebody's shitty to me or, or, or you know shitty to everybody else everybody knows that they're a piece of shit but they've never i'm never i'm not the person that says uh, oh but they've never been mean to me so they're they're totally fine like you know that's not the uh that's mm -hmm. not really my approach um but i am i'm good at compartmentalizing this is the challenge at hand right now, like dealing with this, you know, like, like I said, like that cancer part of it. Um, I, I still specifically remember sitting, it was, uh, it was a month after my diagnosis and I was in for my first, uh, like actually getting checked out for getting it removed, um, and, and putting together like our legit treatment plan. And I was sitting in, uh, in like the cancer ward of this clinic. And I'm surrounded by people that are all, you know, 50, 60 years old. Half of them look like they've been smoking since they were, you know, eight <laughs> years old. Like, and, and I, and having that, having the thought that I don't belong here, like I should not be here. Yeah. Um, and being very frustrated about that. And, but still being able to, to know that that is like, what's going to change that? Nothing. Like I'm here, I'm here to, I'm here to address this problem. Yeah. And going through that and learning, uh, you know, what we were going to do, uh, how we're going to tackle that pro problem, and then being able to shut that down because having other people around didn't help me solve that problem at all. Mm -hmm. Like, they're not going to be the ones that are going to force me to go to the doctor. They're not going to be the ones that force me to go to my checkups, um, yeah, anything yeah. like that. Like, you need to do that. Um, so, yeah, just like compartmentalizing those decisions and things, I, I think is it's healthy, but that it, it's it's hard sometimes and don't always think that you can you know, you just need to always do it by yourself. Um, yeah. Well, what you, what you said there too, it, I don't know. It's always so funny every time it's just funny. is not the right word. It's not what I'm trying to say, but it's just not hard to see why you're at the level you're at. 
you know, going through that, you know, it, what, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. That's a phrase yeah. that everybody says, but you know, you had to go, you had to go through a lot right there and you can, you're taking that same approach with your training. You're taking that same approach when it comes to competition. I mean, does, does the, would you say that a lot of your strength and your mindset for competing and stuff has come through from that, that challenge yeah. going through? Yeah. And I think, I think that that's, that's something that everybody's able to kind of use at their own advantage is, you know, everybody has struggles and everything like that. Yeah. Um, and everybody's are unique. And I think, and, and admittedly, there's a lot of people that there's a lot of people that I know that compete in the sport that have been through a lot worse shit than I have. Yeah. And, and you, you can tell, like, you can see it in them too. Just like you're talking about like this competition, yeah. this competitive mindset. Yeah. Um, it's not it, but at the end of the day, it's not about what you've been through. It's about how you've responded to the things that you've been through and how you're leveraging those experiences yeah. and applying them to different situations. It's like overcoming serious injuries unrelated to the sport mean a lot more than, you know, coming back from a torn hamstring or something like that, yeah. in, in, in my opinion, because they're, you're coming back from something that wasn't related to the thing you love, but still sure. takes it away from that, right? Yep. Yeah, that's that's what makes a champion right there. What yeah. you just said, that's literally, it's not all, it's not all sunshine and rainbows at all. There's a lot of uh, adversity that comes through there, even outside of the thing that you're doing. Yeah. Well, well, the, one of the wild things about strongman, dude, is, is you, you know, we, we work, we work our asses off and we train for so many hours over the course of the, the year for these little tiny moments and these, you know, these five to 10 seconds of just, you know, of hard work and when it all matters and it can all go south really quickly if you don't if you don't have the right mindset yeah and uh and i and you see it happen every year even at the highest levels you see some of the best guys in the world do it um yep. and i think that that's that's something that uh, acknowledging that is kind of the first step because it, it is a secret it, it is a it's a superpower there's not a lot of people that have it um and it's very apparent like you've kind of said that like, you can tell when people have it and it's yep. It's not something where they're just going to come. They're going to come back next year, and it's suddenly going to be there. Like you have to work to get into that mindset and be able to apply that and compete well, um, and train well, and just be a good person while you're out there. Yeah, yeah. There's there's so many places I could go with that, but I'm not even going to. I mean, that right there that that sums that up perfectly. Um, with having uh, the cancer stuff, I don't know how much detail you want to go into that, but I mean, how did that affect you? Like even your, uh, your hormone level, your, I mean, things like oh. that, what did it do for all that? Um, it, it, I was messed up. They, they, I, they told me that you're, you know, I, I think that they say it's not supposed to impact your hormones too much or your testosterone levels too much, but over and over again, I just see that with people like my, um, my levels, I, right. I was 21 years old. So like, even with cancer, when I was, when I was in the middle of my diagnosis, I, I, they, they took, you know, blood tests, all this stuff. So I've got like full, um, full blood panels, obviously. And my, my T was up in, you know, six, seven hundreds, like I think yeah. it was 75, like, which, which is for a 21 year old is, is it's higher, but it's not yeah. like that unheard of. Right. Sure. No. Um, yeah. And then I, uh, you know, I, I stopped take or, you know, I, I go through treatment, um, declared cancer free and I'm kind of just going through, I was, I was in that phase of working out at that point. I wasn't training. I hadn't found a strong man yet. So I was working out for a few years and I'd noticed myself just being tired. Um, not really having any sort of like major muscle issues or anything like that still fit, but like, I felt like I was working really hard for not a lot of uh, payoff, went through the kind of the back injury rehab and everything like that. And then finally said, fuck it. I'm going to like start finding out about TRT, go in and get tested. And I'm, and I'm pulling in the low 100s. Like, I think I was 105. And I was like, hold up. You told me that this wasn't going to be a problem. And you're telling me now that I could have been dealing, like I've, it's been five years and I've just been kind of struggling, like sleeping like shit, like uh, not recovering. And so I've just been, had rock bottom T levels and I was 26 at that point. Like it, it was crazy. Um, what were you noticing? Were you noticing yourself getting sick? Like your immune systems were kind of low. I know you said you're noticing your sleep was struggling. Yeah, not not so much my immune system. Um, like it, it, I would never get colds or anything like that, or like you know. It, but but, and this is true to this day. If I do get sick, like I'm buried. I I am done for a few days. 
Yeah. Um, I don't just have like a overnight sickness or anything like that. So, you know, I would note, I, I noticed that first, um, like if the one time a year I would get sick, it would just be terrible. Um, and then, but my sleep was garbage. Like I was sleeping four hours a night, maybe, um, I ended up getting like one of those, uh, the sleep trackings or sweet sleep trackers, like the whoop band. Yeah. And it was just delivering just garbage. Like my, my recovery was always in the red, like, and like, you know, 20% recovered all the time. Um, and you were just, you were just literally spinning your wheels. Oh, Even yeah. if you were training at that point, your body's not able to recover. That's, that's everything. Recovery is everything. So you're yeah. training, you're literally spinning your wheels completely with your test levels in the dirt. Yeah. And, and, and at that point it's like, I'm going through all these different stretching protocols, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do mobility work as much, as best I can, you know, getting, uh, getting PT, getting massages and things like that to try to try to like heal some of these injuries that I've, or, or not, not injuries, but just, you know, like that soreness and not feeling recovered that I was accumulating just from like doing bodybuilder workouts, not, e not even pulling heavy weight or moving anything heavy at that point. Um, cause straw man wasn't coming for a couple of years still. But like that alone was just a nightmare um, to to try to to try to figure out. And then when you find out that your that your T levels are that low, you kind of start finding out about all this other research. And now it's I know it's kind of glitzy now and uh, clickbaity for everybody to talk about TRT and everything like that. But um, <laughs> it's like genuinely needed TRT at, at that point. Like, and I could I was I was very frustrated by uh, by the lack of people telling me or recommending that I. I bring that up when I'm going in every single year for my yearly exam and telling, telling them like, yeah, I'm fucking tired. I like, I feel, I feel sore a lot. Like, you know, all of these different things. Um, and they well, just don't say anything about it. The doctors, they know, doctors know things from a medical standpoint. That's all they know. They don't know it from a point of your training, the application of what you're doing. That's number one. That's the very first thing they don't. It's not like they're a doctor like Andrew Locke, you know, somebody who's a bench press specialist or some, you know, they're, they're not that they're going there. They don't understand. Oh, we well, should be okay to live a normal. You're not doing a normal life. You're pushing past normalcy. Um, number two with that, they don't society does not want our it's not the same as what it is there's not many masculine they don't want that they would rather your testosterone be low in the dirt and you drink a soy latte that's what truth what they'd rather you have they don't want you i mean walk around oh you're just trying to juice you're just trying to be a juice head yeah. no, i want to feel better and i yeah. want to perform and do the thing i love and be healthy as i can be while i'm doing it you know who wants to go train in the gym and bust their butt and not be able to get better because their test levels are down in a hundred. It, it's, it's crazy to me, man. Like I, I, I recommend, I do not recommend running cycles the way that a lot of people in, uh, in sure. strongman run for the normal person. Sure. No reason to be doing that. But if you, if, if you're over the age of 30 and you're not taking testosterone, I don't know what the fuck you're doing with your life, man, because you're, because it's going down and the, the tools are there to fix the problem. Yeah. And, and it's cheaper than protein powder. What yeah. are people doing? Like it's yeah. it's so weird. I tell my I tell there's one one of my buddies that's a like you know he's like a normie. He's not somebody that competes in strongman or powerlifting or anything like that. He's just going to the gym, and and I've recommended to him to do the exact same thing. Like go get yourself tested. Just figure out what's going on because yeah. if you don't need it, you don't need it. And then you find out if you find out you do need it. Congratulations, man. Welcome to the second stage. Yeah, yeah. But it's just, it's just not as funny. It's not a thing that a doctor is going to recommend you doing. And, and, no. and, and, and I mean, it's, it's, it's a, it's a health problem. It's, it's, you know, it's legitimate. Well, it's a, and we, there's a whole nother discussion about, uh, you know, my feeling about the pharmaceutical just sure. wheel, I guess. Um, yeah. but it, like having low T, or like fixing testosterone. Do you know how many things that that will like? How many other side effects that will immediately alleviate? That they're going to that you're going to get recommendations to get pumped full of other medications and things like that. To, oh, you're sore? Like yeah, take that. Take this pill. You're tired? Here's you know yeah. Here here's some sleeping pills. Like there's there's all these different things that'll pump into you when you just need you just need your testosterone level back up. Um, Go figure. And and oddly, like I will compare testosterone and weed, but like <laughs> it's very similar to that too, man. Like. Cannabis solves a lot of problems that you don't need to be taking a pill for. Sure. Um, I mean, they come up with all kinds of crazy stuff. But um, my grandmother, when she was really old, she was having trouble uh, 
eating. And I mean, she still she still had several years, but she was having trouble eating something else. And they gave her um one of those, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know that well, but it was a weed, it was a pill, it was a weed pill, whatever it was. Yeah. I don't know what do you call this, but that's that's what she did. And she got her appetite up. That's how she got through it. You know, I, I had somebody else close that had, had cancer and they had trouble eating. They did the same thing for them, you know. I mean, uh it, isn't that a better isn't that a better more natural supplement subs uh isn't that a more natural um substance than like you know some crazy drug or some crazy amphetamine yeah it, it's it i feel like i'm taking crazy pills when i just talk about it because it, it's even even what you said yes what ha- yes what worked for them the, the it, it was THC, you know, active ingredient in cannabis. Yep. Uh, that that is what gets got that to them to improve their uh, improve their appetite. But I've I've got a jar of the shit sitting right here that would have done the exact same thing. And at the doctor, they had to they had to kept you know yep. put through a chemical process and put yep. in a little capsule for it to be yep. legitimate. And yep. it's like that shit's crazy to me. Like, not recommended that your grandma should have been you know smoking a joint or anything like that. But like. You you know you you've got edibles you've got tinctures where you can do oils and things like that instead where you're still not putting it into a pill. Um, sure. And then, like, it just it, yeah. It all comes down. It all comes down to everybody. My my grandfather said it all the time. He said it's it's a pie and everybody's got to get their piece of the yeah, pie. Yeah. <laughs> it's all it is. He'd say it all the time. He'd be like, it's just want to get their piece of the pie. He yeah. gets so mad. But that's true. It it is yeah. And I, we we can we can sit here and sound like grumpy old men about it, but it's it, it's sure. it's odd. It, it's one of those things. Everybody knows it's a problem, but it, it's like I don't know what to do to solve it. My my personal first step is just to do things that you know control things that you can do. Yeah. Grow, you know, grow your own medicine. Uh, yeah. You know, like eat your own fruits, eat fruits and vegetables. Just keep to start yeah. start from there, um, and and use every tool at your disposal instead of just you know trying to go to the doctor and, and, and expect them to heal you. Cause that ain't going to, that alone ain't going to be that. Uh, no, uh, just something, something so simple. Uh, when I was younger doing a big bulk phase, it was the first time I ever went to the doctor and they said, Oh, you have really high blood pressure. You have really high triglycerides. And I was a young guy and it was cause I was eating like an absolute cow. Well, when I had high triglycerides, my doctor immediately said, you have to take this, these pills. And it was like a heavy dose to get your triglycerides down. So I did it because, you know, I was told to that by my doctor I had to do it. I think I was only 19 years old. So I took these pills to get my triglycerides down. And then I finally realized, I was like, this is so dumb. I was like, I'm not taking another one. I said, I'm going to go. I, I know now for me to try to be this big and heavy, I'm not going to be Zadrunas, a massive strong man. Cut yourself down. Get back to it. You don't need these stupid pills. So yeah. I did. I dropped a whole bunch of weight. I went back to the doctor. And it was like a year or year or so later. And he said, he said, wow, your numbers are really great. He said, those pills would be working good for you. I said, no, doc, I've not taken those since I left your office. Basically, I said, I've been, uh, I just dropped 40 pounds. And he was like, well, you still should have still kept taking the medicine. I said, why? My numbers are great. And he just looked at me and was like, oh, well, OK. And that's all he said. And that was my doctor. Yeah. That, that I I I hate this because there, there are so there are good doctors out there mm-hmm. that there there truly are, um, but there's so many so many things in the world now that where you just run into these issues of they're so focused or so influenced by external you know what <laughs> again we're going down a rabbit hole here but like external ex- the external parties are influencing your doctor and and sure. that is impacting your treatment sure. and that is not the way that it should be you should no. be able to get, like there should be a full treatment plan, not take these pills and come back and talk to me in six weeks and tell me how you feel. Like that's, that's not it. And they're, they're, it's, it's sad that that's an issue at all. Um, But that's kind of the American healthcare system. You got to look out for yourself, which sucks. Yeah. And I think it's great. You know, um, somebody else I knew I was real close with, they were having some problems (laughs) and you know, the doctors never went and even got them blood work done. You know, they never even got blood work done. They just threw them on a pill. You know, I'm I'm a I'm a Christian, but the Bible says the life of the flesh is in the blood. That's where you start. If you want to know where your levels are, you go to the blood. That's what you found out for you. Oh, well, the, I'm feeling tired. I'm feeling this. The first thing is say, oh, let's check your blood work and see where you're at. For, yeah. for this person, oh, let's check your blood work, see where you're at. No, we're just going to throw you on pills. How can you assess the situation without reading what the results are? 
blood work isn't profitable unfortunately that's that's like that that's really what it comes down to um yep. <laughs> and yeah and and it's like yeah I, I again i'm very negative about the uh about just the the pharmaceutical uh yeah. you know again just monster but yeah. like you, yeah we we you you need to look out for yourself and take it upon yourself to get better blood work yeah. is one of the first stepping stones of figuring those things out because Absolutely. you get the full picture of what you want Every person listening should get their blood work done. Even if you feel good, just get it done because yep. now you, you're you're working off of the full package, the full information that you mm -hmm. need to know to make informed decisions. Um, and and like, I can't recommend that enough for people. Just just get that done and 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 don't spin your wheels like I did for so long. Well, um, even you said you know you get it done. You said you feel good. I, that's especially when you get it done because then you have a baseline of what you should be. You said you got it done at twenty one, and you found out your levels were you know this blah blah. So then when you went back and you were feeling worse, then you realize, oh wow, okay, it was a problem because you know what your baseline is and you're down. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like when when i when i initially got mine done i mean and again like i, I would have never gotten them done at 21 because sure. you just assume that they're, that they're going to be fine um and at that point i did i just didn't know what i didn't know i didn't know that that was something that you should be checking on um regularly because that it's just not, you're, people aren't informed of that and good thing about social media nowadays is that even if it's just people pushing trt what it's doing is it's pushing people to get your blood work done that's the first yeah. part about that yep. um and and that's that's something that I just think that people need to need to start focusing on a little bit more. Uh, even the general public, man, it's just yeah. it, it, they need to do that. Well, how many how many videos we're really going down a rabbit hole now? But I love <laughs> yeah, we are. <laughs> you're talking about the general public. How many people now don't believe um, that you know you can control obesity? I mean, how many videos every time I pull it up on my phone, on my Instagram now, I don't know why, but every time I pull it up, it's talking about that. I mean, yeah, there's things that happen and there's other side effects of, you know, people, their thyroid or this or that. But, you know, you your metabolism slow. They told me for years your metabolism is slow, Ross. You'll never be able to have even six pack abs because your metabolism is slow. You know, you can speed up your metabolism by how, how many times you eat, the size of portions of meals you do, the exercise sizes you do i mean i got all the way down to i mean lean i mean of course i got six pack and you can't get that i mean <laughs> yeah it's 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 wild yeah i mean and i think that that's a little bit of the enabling type culture yeah. which again i'm not i'm not a part of that like i'm you know love love yourself for who you are but don't make excuses about you know why you're why you're out of shape specifically because yep. that's there are a few things in your life that you actually can control that's that it. is something that you can control yeah. and and, that, and if you know it, it's there, there are external factors. You might need to work a little bit harder. Some people need to work harder, but I didn't exactly win the genetic lottery. You know, like yeah. my, 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 my dad is shorter than I am. My mom is shorter than I am. Like they're neither of them. I would, I would say are, you know, like they're definitely not elite athletes, which I joke. I, I say that, but my, my mom actually is kind of an elite athlete. But it's, she, my mom competes in Highland games and, uh, and, and she's actually like, she's competed at worlds a couple of times. She's going overseas again this year to compete in that. So, um, but Highland, <laughs> like, so you're, you're just, you're standing and throwing, right? Like you're not, you're not walking around with like ripped abs or anything like that. That's not the yeah. way that works. Um, but you know, your, your genetics aside, you know, you, you can work past those things and still, and still reach the peak. Um, and I think that that's kind of my current, one of my one of the things I'm interested in is just reaching your you know peak physical condition. Is it possible to do it? What does it take to do that? Um, and that's kind of the path that I'm I'm trying to go down right now. Is you know when you get to this top level, top tier of uh, of competition, it's like you got to do everything that you can do to to get to the top um, and use every tool in your arsenal to, to get there. You're trying to extract every last bit of what your body has for it you know you're trying to do that while walking the tightrope of not having this or that or recovery but you're trying to get the absolute last drop of what your body has for it so you exactly. can lay it out finally at the end yeah. for, like i said for that for that few seconds at yep. the end of the year like yep yep <clears throat> Good deal. well josh this was an awesome one buddy i'm so glad we talked and decided to come back and do another one this was a great part too
yeah, man, this was a blast. I'm happy, happy to come back and yeah, it's always good talking. Yeah. Your, uh, your video did very well too, for, for the YouTube growing as far as it goes, it did very, very good. So hopefully cool. we can keep rolling with this one. We will, we'll keep, we'll keep those views up. We'll get, we'll get some people on this one. I'll make sure we, uh, we push this one out and I, I appreciate everybody listening. Um, yeah, make sure you're following Ross, make sure you're following me on, uh, on Instagram and everything. And yeah, I, 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 just like I said last time, I appreciate what you're doing for the sport. Uh, and I think that, I, th I think you'd agree with me that light, the lightweight classes are kind of the future of the sport. Absolutely. Um, you know, we're, we're it, the, <laughs> the era of just the fat ob obese guys and world's strongest man and everybody only caring about them, I think is over. Uh, yeah. You know, we're, we're, we're the approachable weight class. We, we look the way that everybody wants to look. Nobody wants to be strong and have a beer belly in the general public. They want to be strong and look like you and me. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's uh, there's a lot to be said about that. So I'm happy that you're you're helping bring some of these athletes to the forefront here. Well, I really appreciate what you said there. I, I could I couldn't agree more with what you just said there. You know, it's not it's not always relatable, you know, uh, the other side of the thing. But there's a lot of people that are that would like to maybe get into it. And that's what we're trying to do to grow the sport. But more importantly than that. It's guys like you that I want to have on here and keep talking with because you are the guys that, you know, maybe shouldn't have even got into it. Maybe shouldn't have been, oh, you're not this, you're not the big guy or whatever, you know. And and, and not only that, you actually are really, really good, but you might not have thought of it. But if you put it back to days before, oh, you shouldn't even start with that, you know. You're too short. That's I was told you're too short to ever be a strong man because you'll never be able to do stone load, you know. And yep. – uh, Kind of didn't, that didn't sit right with me. I was like, I like this better though, you know. And that's that's what's so inspiring about about really our weight class, but about these top guys that I'm having on here, you know, especially yourself. I mean, just finding a way. That would be the theme of this one: finding a way. Sometimes when there's not a way, going through those adversities and just continuously trying to get better. You know, it's it's a unrelenting, undying desire to get better. It is, yeah. Like like you said before, it's just that's what makes the champions. And yeah. Again, I appreciate you having all these guys on and uh, and bringing these port personalities up because it's it's fun to it's fun kind of dig, peeling back the layers and, and getting to know some of these guys a little bit more. Yeah, Josh, thanks for coming on again, buddy. You're a champion, and I just appreciate you being on here. And uh, now I'm gonna figure out how I compete against you again at Worlds this year. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking forward to competing you against against you this time. We're actually gonna talk this year. How about that? Good deal. We're actually, have an interaction in person. <laughs> yeah, that'll work, buddy. You all have right, a good yeah. rest of your day, man. You too, man. We'll see you later. See you.